What does that cost, Ed, a, a replica Cobra? Um, I, I, about £200,000, something like that. You can get them made in Devon. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They're really good. <laughs> the Devon <laughs> ones. Why Devon? <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. We are one member down. Chris Cooper can't be with us today. We've not replaced him. We're sorry he's not here. And this will be a little less intelligent because of his absence. Let's dive straight into Goodwood. A few of us were at the members meeting at the weekend. Uh, Many of us would have seen footage, uh, generally got the atmosphere. Goodwood feels like, well, the members meeting feels like it kicks off the motoring year for me. The sun's out. You see some daffodils. People have got their old crap out. Loads of old tin milling about in Sussex. Neil Clifford, of course you were there. I was there. Wearing driving shoes. Oh, God. <laughs> because I wasn't actually driving at Goodwood. I was just moping around <laughs> taking photographs. So, of course, I've got driving shoes on. I think um, um, yeah, yeah right. I was there for a day. Uh, drove drove a racing car, a Lotus Twenty Three. I've not driven one of those before. Uh, really was fascinating. I, I think there's something about Goodwood. I mean, I have um, a complicated relationship with the place. I don't always find them uh, the easiest people to work with, but I I do respect the, the events they put on. They just they just make you feel good, and the way they dress everything. Every time you think this is an ordinary race meeting, you'll turn a corner and there'll be a happy, a merry band of choral singers marching towards you, immaculately dressed and in character. Um, but what really appeals to me is the racing and the race circuit. I think it's one of the unsung great circuits on this planet. If ever you've had the chance to drive it, you must go and do so because it's fast, fast, fast with no runoff. And it's got so much history. It's quite rare to have a circuit that really exists in, its, in the form it's been in for the last... 60 years, 70 years, it, it's that, that does make it very appealing because you can pay your lap times to Sterling Moss and to Jim Clark. You really can do that. Um, so, uh, Neil, any further thoughts of what you saw? What was your, what was your best well, in look, show? I'm, I'm from Portsmouth, so Goodwood. I grew up there as a child when before the Duke restored the whole thing and made it so wonderful. It was a derelict place. I used to go in there in the mid-70s. I'll send a picture. We can put a picture of me up on the derelict wall in 77 with my cagoule coat, um, bombing around the circuit with my brother's Mark II Escort. You could just drive in, you know. It was, you? It was, yeah, just drive in. There was, no, there was no gates, no nothing. So it's a, and it's obviously where all the posh people were from, you know, Chichester and Bosham and Funtington and Lavent. They were where the posh people lived that had Porsches and Jaguars and things. So. It goes right back to my childhood, Goodwood. But it, I think it's the best, best motoring vintage car thing in the world. What, yeah. what would you drive down there in on Sunday, Neil? Uh, I went in an old Porsche. Yeah. Which an one? Old, an old Porsche. Um, two litre short wheelbase. Oh, oh the grey one. So actually, uh, you were, it's, you, green. It's, it's green now. It's green. It's green now. Yeah. You were on, yeah. you were on point there because the Porsche display was pretty seismic, wasn't it? When you saw what they had lined up. All the three litre RSRs and the, you know, the, whatever, the 2.8 RSR from Le Mans. And, um, a, good friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Harvey, was driving around in a three litre RSR in the demo. You know, what a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. So jealous with the 10,000 revs tachometer sort of spun round, you know, all of that geeky stuff. It's brilliant. The uh, the quality of the drive, given the, obviously the value of the grids and and the fact we're dealing with old cars with no runoff, the, the quality of the driving in general there is impeccable as well. I mean, no, I, 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 I went down to watch the Lotus Cortina race. I think there were 34 Lotus Cortinas on Sunday, all right on the edge, you know, with the with some of the best drivers in the world bombing around all within half a second of each other per lap. I mean... Brilliant. No, I um, I had uh, I had dinner with Bernie on Saturday night. As you do, um, as, you, as do. you do. Yep, he was in not Winters, I suppose. I'm sorry. Not Bernie Winters. <laughs> not Bernie Winters. <laughs> um, Bernie, Bernie, and he um, just at the end of dinner, he showed me. He took out his phone, and Ricardo Patrese had sent him some photos of him driving his Brabham BT52 from 1983. And um, I do remember a few few months ago, he was telling me that um, there's a guy who looks after his cars. He was preparing it 
for Goodwood. And I said, well, <laughs> well, what if Ricardo detonates him? He said, he won't. <laughs> like, that was it. <laughs> he just won't. And Chris, um, Chris Cooper was there. And he was sending us some, uh, I don't know if you saw his WhatsApps. Yeah. Live yes. WhatsApps, because Karun was meant to be driving it on Sunday. Yeah. And he said, oh, my God, I think Karun's just detonated Bernie's PT-52. <laughs> you don't want the bolt sending a hitman after you. But apparently Karun had accidentally kill, hit the kill switch and all kinds of smoke, noise, whatever. But he just quietly coasted back and they switched it on. And off he went. And that is that's a hell of a car. That's a handsome car, that Brabham. Is it the oh, BMW? BMW thing. Four cylinder yeah. BMW. That was the, I mean, that's supposed to be the car that generated, depending on who you believe, between 1,000 and 1,400 horsepower in qualifying with marshmallows for tyres. I don't know if it was the 83 or the 84 one that generated that. It was the same, same engine, but it's a scary, scary car. But it's also it's also incredibly beautiful because it's so oh. much narrower than you think, and its narrowness goes up further into the chassis than you expect, and then it just begins to flare for the rads a bit later. So it's something a bit more fighter jet about the way that it appears. Oh, definitely a, a lovely point, and also they're just smaller, aren't they? Yeah, they're just such small. The stories about, the, the, here, stories about the, you know, the crazy fuel they were using, and that when they had guests, they had to have they had to have give you know guests in the garage were struggling to breathe because this awful fuel they're putting in the cars. You know, someone told me the best story about the fuel. He said that it, when they went to Monza, and Bernie totally denies this, he said, when we went to Monza in 1983, he said, you, you could look at the trees above the uh, the garages and above the BMW garage, there wasn't a leaf. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, am amazing. We could all we could all talk for hours about what our favourite car was of the event. You know, it's what would mine be? Probably the D types. I think you like I the think, D types. Yeah, they do look beautiful. I thought the BT fifty two was stunning. I stayed till very late on the Saturday, and I had a lovely moment just on my Todd. No one anywhere near me, just listening to the GT one cars howling around as the light faded, and the big screen was was showing them being a little bit a bit darker and the lights were coming through. And it reminded me, Neil, and you you remember this, it reminded me just back in the day, you could pick those cars just by their engine sound from five miles away. Like when that saline went going, I, I just I hadn't heard that noise in what, twenty years. And it was just so powerful. I just thought you could hear them coming at Arnage, you know, we were camping at Arnage. They would be what, ninety eight, ninety nine, or certainly the GT ones post F one. And you, you know, you're, you're a bit hungover. The tent smells like you can't even say what it smelled like because there's nine blokes rammed in a five man tent. But you, could, <laughs> you, you could hear those cars all the way around the track. I mean, yeah. amazing. But for me, sorry, the Conrad Motorsport 993 GT2 in that light blue turquoise livery. I mean, I, that was a proper transfer. That's with the big body kit on it. Oh, God, that's, that really is the car. So what we're going to do is we're going to segue from that straight into our two-car garage for today because it's it's a Goodwood-themed one, written by Mr. Neil Clifford, so therefore I'm going to need several minutes to read the bug around. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the stream of consciousness from Neil. This, the, the top line in caps is better written version, which caps means shouty, so it's better written version. You've just true. got home from another brilliant Goodwood members meeting and you have decided to pull your finger out and buy your dream pre-66 two-car garage for the revival weekend in September. You've all the right driving licenses, racewear, and most importantly, the appropriate footwear. But as you're always driving other people's cars at these events, it's finally time to put your money where your mouth is and with a budget of £300,000, very generous, Neil, you need a podium-level competitive race car plus a cool vintage car park motor for you your partner and your dog now um i'm gonna go first because normally i go last so i've never driven the racing car that i drove at goodwood before and i now realize i've been a mug not to do so or to at least not to inquire the lotus 23 is a is a little thing of joy it's a it's a delicate tiny little racing car that looks like it belongs to a world of smaller people. If, if, we're, if we're full scale, it looks like it's an eight-tenth scale world car. It was pre-carbs. So, it, it, sorry? Pre-carbs. Oh, yeah. It's, before it's, pasta it's arrived gorgeous, in the United Kingdom. Gorgeous. 
Mm. Um, so my racing car is going to be a Lotus 23 because I drove my friend Chris Goodwin's. And apparently a really, really good one is a hundred and something thousand pounds. It's quite, you know, it's a 150 horsepower <laughs> twin cam engine. Uh, it must weigh under 500 kilograms. And with me currently in full fat spec, I was adding a fifth of the mass to the vehicle. If it was a slight, Chris Cooper got his up to a podium position last year in damp conditions. So I think that's possible. We ended up 10th. We started 25th. So I think that's entirely possible. And it reminded me that I, I think Lotus racing cars are just, I love how simple the nomenclature is. You just have these numbers and they go up. And I love the fact that apparently in, in period, Jim Clark said that the Lotus 30 was just a Lotus 23 with seven more problems. I thought that was a great, <laughs> great summary of the, of the, <laughs> the, the way he named things. Um, so I've got my racing car. Uh, thank you, Chris, for letting me drive it, by the way. It was gorgeous. Now, road car. Hmm. I've got a fair amount of bunts left here, and I might I might spend it or I might not, depending on how good one I can find. But we've not discussed them. I know to some people they're a bit of a joke, but I want a Fasol Vega because I've never I've yeah. never even, I've never <laughs> done one. And I just think if you get if you're going to go the full Goodwood, what, if you turned up in a Fasol Vega, you're going to look the, bob, the the absolute bobbin. Someone could turn up in a 250 GTO next to you, and there's going to be kids pointing at you. So I'm going Fasol Vega Lotus Beautiful. 23. I'm moving Beautiful. on to. Blue. Ed would love it. Um, well, we've done one similar to this before, haven't we? I don't, can't remember what our budget was last time. And I think... Yeah. It and, was and completely different to this one, Ed. It was completely different, completely different. So the, the one car that I saw racing at the weekend, which I used to uh, race, which is not, uh, unfortunately, within the age, so I can't use it, is the Chevron B8. And, you know, the, the Chevron... B8, which is a which is a another four cylinder BMW engine, wonderfully light, very competitive, and fine on a big circuit like Silverstone. You know, a T70 will just monster it. But you know, you put some put some uh, wet conditions or a tight circuit, something a bit more technical, and a B8 will be all over it. But unfortunately, it's 1968. So I'm going to go with the theme of the members meeting, where it, it's not quite as strict as the revival and i think i'm going to have to have a uh, a cobra replica uh oh. race car because I, I you know i like to be at the front and i i'm not sure i really want to be at the back so uh, i think i'm going to go for a cobra and then what does that cost ed a, a replica cobra um I, I, about two hundred thousand pounds something like that you can get them made in devon yeah, <laughs> exactly. They're really good. They're the Devon <laughs> ones. Why Devon? <laughs> Look, actually, but the, the guys that make those, it's real, but it's not real Cobras. You know, could you go and buy one for a million quid, then you make one exactly the same, and then you race it and keep your posh one at home. They're made in Barnstable. Are they? No way. They're made in Barnstable. I love yeah. that. I love and that. that's the place to go, yeah. And okay. so, obviously, I was thinking we'd, we'd have to, you know, obviously you have to have a Porsche in here, but I've beaten it out of me and I've not allowed myself to have a 65 911 or a 65 last of the 356s. And I've gone for something a bit earlier. I've gone for the Gentleman's Express. I've gone for the Bristol 404. Oh. oh. Yeah. Yes. Can't be. I had to go back and check the description to make sure I didn't have a child needing to go in the back, and but the, the, but the hound can go in the back, so that's fine. I like it, Manish. Yeah. What are you going for? So I had a little trawl, and in car and classic, in the little French town of Saint the Saint Emile, I found a three point eight 1962 Jaguar E Type semi lightweight. Oh. It's so beautiful. It's got a roll cage inside. They've stripped everything from the car. Proper racing seats. You can see the fuel tank behind you. It's aluminium. It's British racing green with an orange pouty mouth and an orange pouty bum. And it's just literally, I just looked at it and fell in love. And it's a mere 130,000 euros. A mere 130,000 euros. It really is. And that leaves me almost as much money as I want for a car that <clears throat> I think has got bits of all kinds of cars in it, but it's so unusual, so pretty. I've never, ever seen one on the street, but it's a 1966 Maserati Mistral 4 litre. Oh, yeah. You can just about get your doggy in the back 
And I saw that those things, they, they literally go for anything from 140 to 170,000 pounds. There's a very beautiful, beautiful silver one with black leather inside. Yeah. Exactly the same, 160,000 pounds. The four litre is the best engine, has the wooden steering wheel, and it's just. So mine are two straight sixes to Goodwood. They'd be my, pull my finger out, says. Maserati. Says, oh, it's just such a beautiful sounding name, isn't it? Maserati. Yeah. I'm, just looking, I'm just looking at them on Google now. Just such a great car. And it's got that, you know, it's got that sort of semi hatchback, like a yeah. Porsche 924. Such yeah. a gorgeous car. Such yeah. a gorgeous car. I've often turned up in a 66 car at Goodwood Revival and I get so paranoid about not getting into the right car park that I take my <laughs> v, I take my V5 with me in case I've got to have an argument with the bloke. <laughs> if, you know, if he doesn't know what a D-reg is or whatever. You know. <laughs> I think C, you're you're you know you're in, but I, you worry about D. Have you, have, you, have you have you ever decided that you wanted to do some sort of community policing and go up to other people and go, that shouldn't be here, mate. That that's clearly not. That's yeah, wrong. no, I get very annoyed when you see an F or a G in that pre sixty six car park. You know. Have you ever challenged someone? No. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the viewers out there, um, Neil is about six three. Or are you six three or six four? Six I, 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 three, well, in the right. I just shoes, love the idea four. of the, the finger of truth and justice coming out and going. I'm or or what about if it was a replica? No, there's there's no need to get angry about anything at Goodwood. But when you, I do chuckle when you see an H reg MGB GT in the in the in the pre sixty six car park. I'm like, you've wangled your way in there, mate. <laughs> right now, Neil, you'd have spent. You've probably spent because Neil's actually currently in Miami. You've probably spent, I reckon, the majority of your transatlantic flight ruminating on what what your choices would be. No, the funny thing is, from from age nine, I've thought about these things. You know, I used to lie in bed and you know, what what ten cars am I going to buy? So there's there's no there's no issue with me doing any list at any point in time. Um, I've gone with you, Chris, really. I've gone Lotus. I think once you spend a weekend at Goodwood, it's really difficult not to go British, not to go Lotus, because it is everything that's wonderful about this country being at Goodwood for a weekend. But I've because I don't care about being, I know I've said you've got to be on the podium, but frankly, I don't give a shit being at the podium. I'm super happy being last. Actually, much happier. I don't want to be those guys at the front. I'm not good enough and I, I get scared. So I'd go the slowest thing. Lotus Elite. I mean, what a pretty car. This car was made in the 50s. Yeah. It could be, it could be current. It's unbelievable. It's like the it's like the original iPhone, that thing. I mean, it's so pretty, so small. Was it so the first beautiful. unitary bodied sports car made in the UK? I think it was, wasn't it? Yes. And this has got this has got a Formula One engine in it, pretty much, you know, even if you don't read Wikipedia too much, because it is an engine that actually came from a portable fire engine. You know, um, the Coventry Climax, they, they yes. made fire engines. Yes. They made fire yes. Engines. yes. And and because they made an engine so light that you could carry to put fires out, they thought, brilliant, we're gonna put it in a lotus. What could go wrong? And <laughs> And the other amazing thing about that car is that dashboard could have been designed by Johnny Ive. It's the most beautiful modern from 57, and it looks better than most dashboards now. That lovely little gear knob, those dials, that steering wheel, those seats, beautiful. So definitely Lotus Elite. I'd be at the back, super happy. I'm going to save loads of money here, actually. That's only 100 grand or 120 grand. And then I'm going Jaguar. And even though it's easy to go E-Type because everyone goes E-Type, but you can't win in an E-Type. I know this is not my race car, but unless your dad is the best Formula One driver in the world and he's designed you an E-Type that actually isn't an E-Type, it's a Formula One car underneath, um, you've got to, you know, you've got to go something a bit more niche on a Jaguar. So I've gone the Mark 7. Oh. You know, this was a car that, Sterling Moss almost won his first race at Goodwood. Yes, yes. Um, Rowan Atkinson races one. Is there anything you want to tell us, Neil? Um, <laughs> all, I can, all I can say is 
it's big enough to sleep in the back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you go to the Lavent car park on September the 9th or whenever it is, there may be a strange man with strange glasses sleeping <laughs> in the back of a Mark 7. <laughs> but it's a, it's a bargain of a car and huge thing, handsome thing, and you won't see another one. I think yes, that's, an, that's, that's thing. an important thing. Okay, I, I adore an E-Type, but there's, there's going to be 20 of them. You want to sort of be in something a bit quirkier that no one else has got, like a Fassel Vega, don't you? Or a Mark 7 Jack. Um, I can't disagree with any of those. The, uh, um, the, the, the amazing thing about historic racing is that I think you, could, you can literally find a reason to want to be on every grid in <laughs> any one of the cars. You know, and, and, and there are a lot of people from when I was racing you know, th- th- there might be, you know, eight or nine or ten categories over the weekend, and they would turn up with eight or nine cars, and they were in literally every single race because they might as well be busy that weekend, and they were competitive in every car. It was impressive to see. Roger Wills was one of those people. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, Gary, the funny thing is, well, you, you walk around them. those paddocks, and you're then like, oh, I'd quite like a Hillman in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I think the yeah, Gary Pearson was like that. He, he every race you'd turn up to, he'd be there, be either and you know, he'd be sharing a customer's car in one of his own. Oh, I've just got my D type out, didn't know you had a D type, okay. Um, but, but you know, it's just there it was always something interesting. The other thing I love about Goodwood is that good for those that don't know, Goodwood is it's curious, it's unique in, in so many ways because it is the they make the best classic motor events on the planet. Everyone's trying to copy Goodwood. Uh, and flattering them and not doing as good a job. You know, there are lots of other good events out there, but Goodwood is the best. It really is. Um, and Goodwood invites cars. It doesn't invite people. This is So normally you apply to enter a classic car um, uh, motor race with, you know, as yourself. But Goodwood sends invites out to cars, which is which is very different. And also it's a very clever way of doing it because it means that it's a, it's an instant meritocracy. And it means that if you're, if you're in a car that's entered into a race um, or invited, you're the, you know, and you're worth a hundred grand, then you're you're there with billionaires. It's, you're all the same, uh, which yeah. is it's a really good way of doing it. But it does mean that you find pockets of real cleverness where people have actually thought about this. They thought, right, what car do I need to get an entry to Goodwood? And it's normally about variety because they it's all very well. They could invite the ten best Cobras to be in the TT, but maybe they don't want to see ten Cobras. They want to see some Listers. They want to see some crazy stuff that was, you know, that people have forgotten about or someone's researched a vehicle and rebuilt it and brought it back to life. And I love the cleverness, the little niches that people find. And those cars become little Goodwood heroes. I, I always love walking around the paddock and thinking, yeah, an imp, why is, why is that here? Exactly. Well, because it probably came third at the uh, Aintree in 1960 something. And someone, <laughs> found, someone found a dusty old ledger in an attic and decided that they were going to find that car I love those stories. That's what Goodwood's about for That's me. so true. And also, a good old Lord March has a Bluetooth connection to God on weather, right? Every, <laughs> every single event, the, the clouds part. You know, it's like a Monty Python sort of thing. And the blue sky arrives and the daffodils pop up on the Thursday. No one else has got that. You've got a Silverstone Classic in July. It's pissing with rain. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. And anyone that's been to the full revival later in the year, when you're in the car, when you're out in the car park or in the camping park and you've had a right skin fall the night before and at 7.30 a.m. you get woken up when you get you get literally just get dusted by a, by a spitfire and a hurricane in the morning. It's just outrageous. So you must go, you must experience it. It's one of the few events that isn't overrated. It's everything that you see on the tin. Moving on now to a very important uh, issue to discuss. What's your favourite stretch of motorway? This is this is right up there with the most oblique things I've ever discussed in my life. Because, because actually, I now realise it's one of those subjects that does bind the genuine car weirdos together because we think that way. And I've never, I don't think, had the chance to discuss this with with people that are allowed out in society to walk among us. So, Manish, what's your favourite piece of motorway? So, I um, grew up in Basingstoke, and uh, the M3 travels. Ooh. I mean, it just takes you southwest into Basingstoke. And um, when I was a kid, we would hear about famous people who got pulled up by the police on this stretch of M3, which is 
practically straight. And it goes between, it's, it's just literally south of Nately, Skewers, Hook and Hartley Whitney. Yeah. And then I, I think it's probably about six or seven miles of dead flat, dead straight. And so it was David Essex, when I was a kid, got picked up there. In a oh, what a handsome man he was. Yeah. Silver Dream Machine. Silver oh, Dream Machine. machine. So a dream machine. So he got pulled up in a black Porsche. Eric Clapton got picked up there in a Ferrari. This is sort of in the 70s. I remember, and these numbers that they got pulled up for, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, they're sort of, you know, in the 130 mile an hour numbers. So um, a friend of mine, I think I mentioned him before, Dan, his father um, bought a BMW 635 CSI. Yeah. It was exactly the same as my stepmother's Car, car color, what I was telling you about. So deep metallic green, tan leather. And he gives me a call and he says, Dad's out for the weekend. Shall we take the shark out? And I said, Okay. Because we used to call it the shark, you know, the mm-hmm. front is just very slightly wedged. So Dan got this thing up to 132 miles an hour on that little stretch that I'm talking about, pre speed cameras. We're both teenagers. This should never have happened. Big disclaimer, do not do this. I don't condone this. But I'd read about this stretch of motorway in the 130s, and we did it. We did it in 1986. And that's, that a, is that's a big speed in 1986 as well. Anything over 120 was really strolling really on, wasn't it? Back then. So do you remember that dial went up to, I think it goes up to 160, doesn't it? Yeah, well, or it might have been one of the ones that went to 140, but then had a one. That's right. Yes, it, yes, but not, yes. Not, not, not written as 150. Exactly, exactly. That was it. And I just remember it just going... Oh, it's, like, it's another subject, this. The, 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 the psychology of how high a Speedo's numbers would go speedo. as a kid. If you, if you sat in a car and, it, and the Speedo went to 180, I'd I just have a brain fart. It's like, well, this can't... This is, a, this is the space shuttle. It's not possible. But what was wonderful is you believed it. Of course you did. Yeah, of that course you do. Right, I can't believe that's that's for next week. Stop, Chris. Stop. Um, <laughs> Edward, what's your favourite piece of motorway? Um, well, you sprung this upon us. We weren't expecting it, so it got me thinking. And there's two things that I I like to drive quite quickly on a motorway. So there's always something quite exciting around knowing where the speed cam, well, not the speed cameras, where the static police cars used to be waiting. And there was there's one. On the way to uh, up down the M4. This is not my favourite stretch, but if you go past the first Swindon Junction, you're deciding with yourself. You've only got. I'm getting off at the next Swindon Junction, so that I've, I've got to decide: Do I want to go over that brow, thinking that police car's waiting this time or not? You know exactly where it is, Chris. Normally, I pussy out and I and I tether off and bring it back to something starting with a um, seven. Um, Six. A six, six, sorry, a six, six. Uh, five, five, no, sorry. I got... <laughs> is this junction 15 or 16? So, so you're uh, heading, he's heading westbound, he's between Marlborough and Swindon, that's exactly where he is. Correct, yeah. yeah. But that's not my favourite stretch. There, there's two two bits of motorway, because I can get away with doing what I like to do, which is uh, Rapello to Genoa on the, uh, on the A12, Ooh. through those tunnels from Portofino, heading back towards France. That, you know... If you're in a car that makes a good noise, I think that's the Chris where you were going with the GT3 in Stradale, wasn't it? Along there, yeah, yeah. But that's amazing. And then the other bit is from Alba up towards Turin, which I think is where Ferrari back in the day used to go and test some of their cars flat out. And you know, the Italians are nutters in cars anyway. And when you give them a clean bit of motorway, they are pedal to the metal. So. Uh, and and I uh, and I enjoyed doing that when I was living that direction. So that yeah, I, I'd I'd go to Italy and I'd go on to the A12 or the A6. I think. Um, Neil Clifford. Well, I failed the Mensa IQ test because I only stuck with the UK motorways, and I'm annoyed now that Ed has a more creative brain than me. But anyway, I'm sticking with <laughs> British bloody motorways. When, when you, every couple of years, pre-COVID actually, it's been difficult to bloody do it post-COVID, when you organise a weekend away with your mates and it's like herding cats 
and you're trying to get everyone a to stick the money in because you've rented the house in the Lake District or Scotland and you're trying to get everyone to book the same holiday off and you're trying to coordinate this bloody thing because I am a coordinator I'm the guy that organizes that shit and everyone just says yes or no and they're turning up and 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 when you're driving up the M6 because you're going to Scotland you're going up to Scotland for a sort of Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, back Sunday, and you're going to Balahoolish to see the, you know, the James Bond road, or you're going to Sky, or you're going up to Loch Ness. When you get north of Manchester and you're going up to Preston and it starts to rise, it starts to go up. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I'm... and the traffic's disappeared. All the lorries have gone because they've all gone to Manchester or Liverpool. And you're rising up and you're like, I'm on my way to Scotland. And that M6, it's a beautiful road because you can see the Lake, the Lake District on your left and you see the Kendall sign and you're then like Gretna Green. That's a lovely feeling because it's a Thursday and it's two o'clock and you know you're going to get a bit too pissed tonight and you're going to, you know, going to have a laugh and mess about with your mates. And we don't do it enough anymore. I think COVID's buggered that up a little bit. But it's the M6 north of Manchester with the Lake District on your left. Is that near you know T-Bay what? Services? Exactly. I've never been in this bloody T-Bay Services. No, but it's exactly there. That's one of the big... That's one of the big... That's one of the good sections. ones. Yeah. One of the things I love about going up there, Neil, you're quite right. It's lovely. You start very, going up. It's a very romantic piece of road because you, there is this sense of going up. You always feel when you're going north, you're going up. When you're going south, you're going mm. down. That's <laughs> confirmed. When you're going in that direction, but also <laughs> if you go there in November or late October, early November, down here it's because you know because we've all messed up the environment. It's it's 16 degrees still, but you start to see snow on the on the tips up yeah, there, the nice. caps, and you think to yourself, "Hang on a minute, I might be in the Alps here." It it's is lovely. Yep, I do think so. Well, right, so that feeling of going up on the yeah. M6. Yep, I'll take that. Get to Carlisle. Um, mm. Here we go. So I've I've. I probably, I think I can safely say I've driven on more motorways in more parts of the world than most people. Um, and I, I do love them. I, I also think this is a, maybe this is a call to arms to defend the motorway because multi-lane uh, asphalt is considered to be a bit basic. It doesn't have the the majesty of a, of a, of a sort of a rasher of, of just two lanes going through a, a mountain pass, you know, where you have to overtake cars. But but motorway done well, dual carriage done well, can be just as joyous. It might not be as technical or as challenging for the vehicle, but maybe you can enjoy the scenery a bit more and maybe you don't necessarily enjoy the rhythm the car's in as much, but you can get into a real rhythm. So for that reason, I I find it difficult not to go over some of the passes. I think dropping off the Brenner Pass down into Italy is is just unbelievable. It makes you feel like you're in a James Bond movie. Can't believe that someone built a road this beautiful. And again, that sense of going down so coming off the peaks, and then you, you, and as you come down, you feel the ambient temperature get warmer around you, and suddenly you've gone from snow caps to Italian people not wearing that, you know, wearing beautiful thin linen clothing. Um, so I love those areas. Mm-hmm. I think, I think, in terms of raw naughtiness, the autobahn has to have a mention. But I, <laughs> I find the autobahn quite frantic because the, the opportunities come few and far between to really go, and you feel you have to use it. So you find yourself constantly kicking down to get up to the speed then you break again for the speed limit so i'm going to avoid that with one mention and that is there was a road north of botrop where brabus used to test their cars which really was a motorway to nowhere it went the the motorway went north from botrop up towards the dutch border and um and it just stopped and it meant that if you turned around at the top to come back down and you and you were a bit naughty and blocked the cars getting on it you could have if you wanted 15, 20 miles of absolutely clear motorway. And we went there with Brabus and they did it back in the day. They said, right, if we stop here now, we know that's clear, go as fast as you want. And they gave us a EV12 or some ridiculous thing with a V12 engine. And it strolled along at 210 miles an hour with the guy going, it's like our private test track. The only problem is I went there 10 years later and they continued the motorway. And I couldn't, I couldn't work out where it had stopped before, um, which really scrambled my mind. But this is a long way of saying that I'm going to, I'm going to go abroad. Because I think that there's a piece of motorway between Fréjus uh, and a, a turning on the A8. So I'm, I'm south of France, Fréjus. It's all mountainous and it sweeps everywhere. And you just, it's about six miles of it. And you come off a turning towards the Lac Saint-Cassien. 
and I just you'll find it on there on the on the, on the road book. It just reminds me of summer holidays as a kid. It reminds me of no speed cameras, no police. It reminds me of seeing women going pillion on motorbikes with a bikini top. It was just glamorous and it was always hot and the cars, you always saw something magnificent that you didn't expect to see because there was just enough money that had leached across from Monte Carlo. First time I saw a Pantera on the road was on was on that stretch of motorway. Wow. And I, I, do, I do think there's something about Mediterranean climate motorways. I think we, we yes. agree because these roads are not far away from what Edward was describing. That they are, yeah, they're romantic pieces of road, and I, I and I don't think anyone should be ashamed of enjoying a dual carriageway or a motorway. It's it, it, the car's still doing something. You're still exploring and absorbing what's around you. Isn't it amazing that I can I can structure a defence of motorways, but I can't structure a defence of driving shoes. Have <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, driven the? Well, no. Ca carry on, Manish. Carry on. No, I just wondered what colour the Pantera was. Can you remember? It was that very. It was two tone. It was the very dark red with black below the oh. door. Do you oh, remember that? Really I remember it as a kid. I remember seeing it and going, "Oh!" And the noise it made, and as it accelerated away from the payage, those little vortices of it was burning a bit of oil, and it was just these blue puffs, wisps came out of it. I was just beside myself. Just I mean, narrow body Panteras are. Oh, that is that is a cool car, isn't it? Yeah. First time I saw a Pantera was in um, was in California. I mean, I'll never forget it. Mid eighties, I was visiting my uh, dad and stepmother, and I just it was yellow with the black underneath. I just never heard or seen anything so loud and low and angry and beautiful. Really, really fantastic car. Yeah, they are. I think your point is, Chris, about about. The f we call it as an, as an official term. We call it me and my mates. It's called early glimpses. And when you're when there's there's five or six of you with a nice distance between you as you're going up to into Switzerland from the bottom of France, and you see the early glimpses of the snow. You know those. The, then you're like, oh, we're there now. Yeah. yeah, that feeling of seeing the little mountains in the in the in the in the distance. It is an official term amongst my friends called early glimpses. Yeah. And do you do the same going towards the sea as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When I'm driving, it's, 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 it's a little bit like Quadrophenia. When, when, I was, when you drive to Goodwood, and if you remember in Quadrophenia, when they come over the hill and they stop, they all pull up in, on the scooters, and there's, I don't know what Who song they're playing, um, Bell Boy or something, and then they see the sea. And I saw it on um, Sunday morning, because literally I'm there at 7.31. So you come over the South Downs at about 6.30, and you can see the sea. And, of course, it's a very emotional thing for me, because you can see Portsmouth, you can see Isle of, the White, Isle of Wight, you can see Chichester Harbour. And that feeling of seeing the sea when you've been in London an hour before is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. All of this stuff reminds me that I think when people like me push beyond road driving and they get into track driving and then they get into racing. We forget the joy of just driving on the public highway. You know, you don't need to be door, door on the door handles or rubbing. I think it's better. Or, yeah. I think in many respects Honestly, it is. Better. Yeah. And I, I suppose that's why increasingly I feel I want slower cars on the road because the, the danger for me is that having such a fast car, these modern cars so fast, give me something a bit slower and I can maybe enjoy what's going around me without getting in trouble. Well, you know, um, we go to um, we go to the my my in laws live in the Caribbean on a little tiny island of Tobago, and the roads there, are, I mean they're ancient, they're windy, they're everything you'd imagine going up and down hills, and uh, you can never go more than thirty miles an hour there, and I don't think there are any cars there that go more than they're all basically reconditioned Japanese cars, and we we weren't the same thing, the sort of Isuzu. It's supposed to be a four by four. It never is. I think the best one wheel works, to be honest. But there's just something about, I mean, Neil described it. It's just the rhythm of getting curves right. And it is left hand drive there. So that makes it very easy. And there's one particular bit. You literally go around the corner and to your right, you've got the Caribbean Ocean. You know, you just suddenly see it hitting a little cove. And, you know, very often you, you, you just have to pull up, look down and think, you know, I've driven here and it's magnificent. And I'm going to have it's a little ice cream. You don't even feel, 
yeah, you don't even feel the need for you know a beer. You can just sit there, just look at it, get this thing inside you, and just drive home. That is, you know, I, I totally agree with you. Road driving doesn't have to be flat out. It's joyous. Moving on, I think we're all a little bit, uh, yeah, emotional. emotionally weakened through that. Maybe yeah. a little bit of group therapy there. Have a hug. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is an emotive subject for me, and it was one that Neil proposed because he's he's definitely got the big brain here. Um, last week, uh, in the in the sidebars of car magazines and car websites, was was announced very quietly the death of the Golf. Volkswagen uh, will not uh, develop, develop the Golf further, so the Golf Mark Eight is the final Golf. I, they didn't say how long it's going to go on for specifically, which was quite telling. Actually, we could discuss that in a minute. But there won't be another Golf. It's Europe's best-selling car. It has been, you know, really since records began, meaningful records. Um, everyone has a story about a Golf in their life. It's possibly the most recognisable car name, certainly in the Western world, um, excluding America. Um, uh, and I, I'm very sad by the news. And I'm also I'm quite confused from a sort of corporate level as well as to why you would why you'd abandon such a wonderful name. Manish, what do you think about golf? I don't mean Rory McIlroy. When my stepmother was a jobbing doctor in England before she went to California, she had a golf. Guess what it did? 1.6 litre golf. It started every single morning. She had to go and see a patient. And it was like your Ford advert, but a better version of it almost. You know, this paediatrician, throat GP, completely reliable car fantastic interior it looked exactly the same two and a half years after she bought it on the day that she bought it you know medical bag in the back stethoscope sweet wrappers it's the most beautiful evocative name in a car that we could all buy and remember i you know the what, what was the first car that you wanted to buy when you passed your driving test in the mid 80s it was either an xr3i or a ford oh, or a Volkswagen golf gti yeah. We all wanted one. When Clarkson yeah. wanted to show you how quick a Lamborghini Diablo was on top gear, he put it against a Vol Volkswagen Golf. When Luca Montezemolo got out dragged in his Ferrari 348, it was by a, a bunch of boys in a black Golf, Golf GTI. I mean, so to get, and just actually on that Luca front, you remember he talked to us about something very simple, which was standing at a Fiat board meeting saying, you can't kill the name Panda. It's the most yeah. stupid thing that you could possibly do. That's a really good make... point, man. It's a really good point. I think That's for me, I understand that that technology is changing, that the way that the, the legislation is forcing car companies to go is is now unstoppable, whether we like it or not. But I think it's just this idea of you've got you've got this crown jewel. Why would you not want to nurture it or find another way of reinventing it? Neil Clifford, you're a man that sells stuff. If you <sighs> if you had something as brilliantly recognisable and simple as the word golf in your armoury. Could you imagine abandoning it? I, d I don't think this story can be true. I had, to, I had to go back and check that that wasn't the 1st of April when that was written. <laughs> because it's such a stupid thing. But these are also the people that got rid of the Beetle. Yeah. Right? They've got they've got a bit of, um, got a bit of history on this form, mm. yeah. Yeah. But also, it's part of a group that, what's the first and last rule of Porsche? Never get rid of the 911. They attempted it once, didn't they, with the 928, which was an utter disaster. So I, I, I really completely don't understand it. Who cares about ID3, ID4, ID5? What a load of wank <laughs> that is. <laughs> No wonder they haven't been successful, those cars. They've got the worst names ever in the history of the motor industry. And golf golf is, well, as you say, everyone, everyone's grown up with a golf. It is the, we'll have a debate one day about peak car, and it will either be a 911 or a golf, wouldn't it, fundamentally? Yeah. That, that would be, that was what our conclusion would be. Do you imagine Hermes saying, we're just going to stop doing the Birkin handbag? or the Kelly handbag, or Gucci sitting around a boardroom table saying, you know what, this loafer, I think, we <laughs> I think we stopped doing it. Or the Rolex, you know, this GMT, it's a bit boring, isn't it, this GMT thing? I don't think we'd do that anymore. I don't really sell. I mean, it completely makes no sense at all. And this is from a company that, 
you massively respect. So I, I think it must be bullshit. It must be an April Fool. Do you think it has anything to do with sort of, you know, just the legacy of emission scandals? Do you think there was some no. element of... No? I don't Can't think the be. Gulf was tainted with that. No, the Gulf wasn't, but just it's just this idea that Volkswagen, we are moving on. Volkswagen as a brand was tainted, but it shows you actually that you could argue that Gulf as a word, as a brand in itself, perhaps assumed a, a, a greater power than the word Volkswagen. You know, Gulf really was, it, it was just, it was the answer to pretty much every motoring question that you asked. And I, I yeah, I, I echo everything that Neil just said. If you've got a winner, why would you... Why would you then reinvent, well, invent your new electric range with with that is poorly styled? Let's face it, ID three and four have struggled because they don't look right, and they're not Teslas, and then kill the Golf. It just, if, if, if at the very least, wouldn't you try and slap the Golf badge on something electric and see if you could get away with it? That would be the most obvious thing to try and do. I, I think there will there, there will be an error if it's true and they're doing it in ten years' time. We'll all be sat here on the very old Collecting Addicts podcast going, well, there you go, they brought the golf back. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm surprised you're feeling as romantic as that, Neil. I, I, and, and Chris, you said if you've got a winner, do we know it's a winner for them? And I, I've got to say, in the, the life... Well, you'd have to assume, Edward, it is a bit of a winner, given it's the best-selling car in Europe for the last 20 years. No, no, well, is, yeah, but is it now? Is it is it doing the numbers that it needs to be doing for them now now as a product and, and I'm guessing the fact they're going to kill it probably not um and and, and I think unfortunately you know we, we exist here as as addicts and as car nuts that are passionate about motorway I think we can all be pretty sure that the next generation will not be talking about their favorite motorways and they won't be talking about the golf and I'm not so and, sure about that no, well you, 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 you might be right and we might be proven wrong you know Apple wasn't a bank 48 hours ago, and now it's about to be the world's largest bank. You know, we used to Google things, and now we're going to use other forms of, of yeah. ways of doing things. And, and I think just the life I live day to day, nothing surprises me. And I think these, these big manufacturers certainly will have very expensive uh, committees and design agencies telling them which way they think they should go. And they'll They'll be in so much confusion, they probably can't help themselves but listen to it and just change their strategy. And I think the golf is probably, uh, it may well come back. It may not be going, Neil. As you said, it might be an April Fool. Well, but... just, I, I, to touch on that, in many ways, I agree with you, Edward. And this, this mm. podcast exists to allow older people to win. So that's the whole point. You know, we're not doing <laughs> it for your enjoyment, dear reader or, or listener. It's because we want to we talk shit. And you know, in the comments section, when people win, you know, if you don't like free shit, don't listen to it. I couldn't care. Um, but, but, I, also, I really... but Chris, just from a, just a, I was going to say what, one other thing here, which is a, which only is for me, by the way, is that you know I've obviously grown up in a car family, and Volkswagen has not formed any part of that family. So the only connection I have with the Golf is the only car I've ever driven in my life where the clutch has gone. Um, so I, I, it doesn't resonate with me, other than. GTIs are quite cool, quite like the Tartan interior, quite like the the Mark One GTI. But it just it means nothing to me uh, in a in, it, from any form of motoring passion. Oh, Vienna! Oh, humbug! Um, but, but I think <laughs> I think but what, what I was going to say was this idea of. Nor does uh, the Mondeo, by the way. Uh, well, I think <laughs> this idea of regeneration. The Sierra was a mistake. Of course, I it was. But I think this idea, this idea of, the thing, of, of us acknowledging change. Uh, and it's happening at a profound pace in the car industry is one thing. But I get the sense that what's happening now is that we've got, you know, we've got millennials, not Gen Z's, we've got millennials um, now in very senior positions in, in many companies. And there is a, a, a bit like the pride of lions coming in to take over from the old, the old hmm. guard. There's a bit of a sense of a, there's a, ne a necessity to clear out in a way that there wasn't before. It's almost like they, they want to clear out the ground. I mean, it's, they either need to do something, ra they feel they have to do something radical, and I don't want to wade in on the Bud Light thing, but that, from a marketing perspective, is just the most fascinating case study for any student uh, of marketing. And I think in the car industry, our version of that is this idea of, best look, okay, it might have been the best-selling car forever, but sales have dropped off a cliff. No one wants these things anymore. It's going electric. Let's get rid of it. We can reinvent ourselves. I think ourselves. that's dead right, Chris. I think someone in a strategy meeting has said, we cannot connect golf with electric. 
yeah. It's a it's a it's an internal combustion engine brand. Therefore, it's in the past. Chuck it in the bin. And our goal fee, which frankly I had one, and it was useless because it did about four miles to the electric, and then it was a hybridy thing, and it wasn't one or the other apart from having a little blue bit on the back. That wasn't successful. Therefore, they're like that. That can't be. That's not part of our future because it's a internal combustion engine. They've got it wrong. Everyone would love a Golf Electric, I'm sure. I think you're right. I think you're you right. trust the brand. You're not going to. Who, who's going to get interested in ID three? Well, it's interesting that of all the vehicles they've released, by far and away the best received is the ID Buzz, which is the new uh, transporter, cool. the, the, yeah. new, the new bully, which just looks fantastic. I might have one of those tomorrow. Very cool. Yeah. So it, they've they've inadvertently created a hero in amongst a load of frankly average looking vehicles and the you know, problem is with that thing i went out to look at the buzz it's just a van yeah and it's 60 grand i, I wanted be- i wanted beds in the back and a kettle and a cooker <laughs> you've got a, a mark tent. 7 jag for that <laughs> yeah. yeah you wait you wait but it, you know it, it, i thought oh, that's you know 60 grand's a bit ridiculous but if it's a camper i mean we need to talk about camper vans at some point Oh, we do, yeah. I, I don't mean to be dispassionate about it, and and I and I and I would hope that anyone who's not interested in the golf because it just doesn't resonate with them, and actually people that aren't that interested in driving on beautiful motorways can still go to Goodwood on a lovely day and just appreciate heritage, and 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 I think some of that is more important than a hatchback VW, personally. There was actually a Golf in the, what used to be called the Jerry Marshall. Whatever it's yeah, called. Mark it was, Martin, I think yeah. it was on its side, wasn't it? I think it did have a... It Beautiful. did, uh, yeah, did do some flat fishing. Yeah. Right, now we're going to move on to... <clears throat> this is a contentious topic, but it's personal. So there's no right or wrong answers here, Manish. I can see you grinning already. Um, Manish has to go last. <laughs> he does. What's your favourite F1 livery? Neil Clifford. After a weekend in Goodwood, it's very difficult to not say, well, in the olden days, when there was no liveries, it was all about the colour. If you were green, you were BRM and Van Wall and Bentley. If you were red, you were Maserati, Lancia and Ferrari. If you were silver, the clever, bloody, devious Germans polished off the white paint and went silver to make their cars lighter, the blue cars... I don't know what they were. Renaults, Tyrrell, maybe I Bugatti. Mean, there, yeah. there is the, the, the yeah, the maybe oh, Bugatti, Bugatti. Yeah, Bugatti. So yeah. <clears throat> I suppose it was all about those colours, where you were a colour as a country, which I thought was amazing. But my choice is not that. My choice is a Manish, because I know a little bit about everything. Manish annoyingly knows a lot about bloody everything. So I'm sure you will you will add to this story, Manish, the London Rubber Company. <laughs> otherwise known as Durex. I had, a, had an incredible opportunity to meet John Surtees a couple of times and he showed me around his wonderful collection of cars at his house. The Durex car actually wasn't there, but he, he was brilliant at getting the weirdest sponsorship. So he had Matchbox, he had um, Tetley tea bags, Oxo, who the hell gets fucking OXO sponsorship? <laughs> I mean, how, how, pers- how persuasive must he have been to get OXO? But the, 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 the winner of me was the Durex one. Manish, I hope you know the story, but in uh, 75 or 76, the white livery with the purple and the gold stripe, and it was banned. The BBC, I think that was the story, Manish, wasn't it? We couldn't even, they couldn't even show the F1 because there was a car going around with a Durex logo on it, be it that every other car had these things that you put in your mouth and you died. That was all okay. <laughs> but a Durex, oh, absolutely not. Manish, so I John, thought you, you flamed that car. <laughs> sorry? Get, I, I thought, thought you flamed the Durex car. <laughs> No, I didn't. Neil did. No, no, it, was, cool. it was basically 76, the BBC. It was the early days of trying, Bernie was trying to get Formula One televised as much as he possibly could. And in those days, you know, you, you had a very tough time um, persuading host broadcasters to do it. You know, they just wouldn't do it. They said it was too expensive. 
there wasn't something like a football to watch, you know, as Chris Cooper's made this point in the past that there's action all the way down a field. So what does a cameraman look at? You know, the most exciting thing to him or trying to turn out him. And he said that um, John Surtees had managed to get this fantastic sponsorship from the London rubber company with Durex and big letters. And auntie just said, no, we're not having it. The only problem was that a man called James Hunt was giving Nicky Lauda a bloody hard time in the world championship. And then after um, the Nürburgring, um, it looked like, you know, the championship was going down to the wire. And then um, in, in 76 at Fuji, Bernie actually paid for that television coverage. And by that time, James Hunt was so big, the Hunt louder rivalry was so big, Auntie had to re re relent, and so did um, ITV Sports. So actually, they did end up televising the Durex. <laughs> the, 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 the irony is the BBC probably filled the gap where they didn't put the previous Grand Prix with Jimmy Savile, which is a bit yeah. odd, isn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what a Anyone who's ever met John Surtees, he was not going to back down. That man was mm. not a backer downer on anything, let alone a Durex logo on an F1 car. No. Lovely Good man. Friend. Lovely man. I mm. think um, I was watching uh, the British GT last week at... Um, Oh, part. Anyone spot the GT4 McLaren that was only for only fans? Yeah, I saw it. Was only fans. Yeah. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> um, I think. Um, I don't know. I, I, I got Manish. You've got to say what yours is. You just, as ever, because you're such a polymath. You've just basically helped in Neil's description, but you've not told us what your favourite one is. Well, can I just say that <clears throat> I think the worst livery for me ever. I was going to start off with. It's the 2007. Honda Earth livery. <laughs> Earth car. Earth car. I, God, just, I, and this has nothing to do with green credentials or non green. Just the idea that somebody sat down and went, right, we've got no sponsorship. What should we do with this high revving V8 engine going around the world, you know, 20 times? Paint it like the planet Earth. Just do it, it'll work. It's just literally the you, you sort of want someone to break in with some orange powder, don't you? Yeah. Paul Jensen button out of the car, jump into the cockpit, spray orange powder everywhere, and just get the event postponed half an hour. Such, was that the car such, that you, was that the car they were caught cheating at Imola in, or was that actually a BAR? No, that that yeah, no, that was a little bit. That was a bit later. That was yeah. one with a double petrol tank and all the rest of it. Yeah. No, this was too green. I also thought the BA the nineteen ninety nine. BAR car that was half Lucky Stripe. Yeah. yeah. Like five oh, I like that. But it had a zipper down the middle. The ugliest I thought in modern times was the MasterCard Lola. I don't know if you remember that. It was just sort of <laughs> yellow and red and blue, but the top was white and it only, I think it, you know, it did about two races. They ran out of money even on their MasterCard. But um, I think you have to go for iconic Marlborough McLarens mm. from from 74 to 96. Obviously, John Player Special Lotus is from 72 to 86. But if I had to go for my absolute favourite livery, we've talked about this car already, it's the 1983 Brabham BT52. Oh, and they no. They switched the livery. They switched it halfway through the season. If you look at the early races, the top of um, the cone, right around the side of Pico and Patrese, was blue and the sides were white. And halfway through, I think it was um, Professor Peter Stevens himself who said, switch. And suddenly the top became white. The sides became navy blue. Parmalat, Santal on, mm. the, um, on the, on the uh, airbox in green, just a simple green line, and feeler giving you that tiny bit of red, and that's it. Yeah. So it's just basically it's so white, navy blue, red, tiny, tiny detail of green. And Patrese's helmet, I mean, I think a lot of people love Piquet's helmet with that lovely red teardrop, but Patrese's helmet, for me, just the simplicity of four slightly thickening circum circumferential blue lines, just stunning. Absolutely stunning. We do have your favourite helmet at some point. Slightly, we'll do uh, helmet, yeah. It's slightly rooted me there because I was going to go, I have to say 52 is the car for me as well. Um, um, as much because I was so 
inquisitive about these brand names because I, I didn't I didn't know what they were. And one of the mm -hmm. greatest problems in life was that Parmalat to me I thought was I thought it was a slip on loafer or maybe it was a, a, a watch or something that just glamorous. When I found out it was like powdered milk that was really just a money laundering exercise, that was a bit shattering for me. And I, and I have had an uncomfortable relationship with, with investing time in these brands. I can remember when McLaren returned to West, um, which was a, I don't think they were great looking cars, the, the, the livery at all. I don't like the logo much of the West cigarettes, but I, I was a McLaren devotee so i started smoking west cigarettes absolute coffin nails they bloody stripped my throat I had to go back to the old <laughs> marlboro's terrible things um so bt52 for me i have to say i i do find some of the liveries of modern cars quite tricky because I, I i i forget them too quickly which must mean they don't resonate very well with me i need a manish to go do you remember the whatever and then i'll go oh yes i do but they're not mm. really in my head so i think i'd go for it's got to be a Ferrari for me. I'm amazed no one's mentioned Ferrari. I think I think anything of the modern era, their cars didn't look quite right. But if you go back to 78, 79, would that be a 312, something like mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. I just think I, I, they used to, they were captivating. And I loved, I just, I didn't really, I, I always used to look for where the Agip sticker was because I used to just yeah. love the yellow Agip sticker. But the red and also the typeface, the way they'd write Schecter, or louder, with a particular typeface the sign writer would do. So I'm going for a late 70s Ferrari, I think. It's just, and also exposed aluminium on the edges, of, on the side edges of the wings. Yeah. They, they were glorious looking cars. Edward? Beautiful. Well, we've talked on a few of these about our era of different things, our, who was our bond, et cetera. And, and for me, the, the, the early 90s was my era of Formula One. You know, I was. 10 or 12 years old and those, those I used to go to Silverstone every year with my father and you know watch go go and do pit walks get up close to the cars and the car for me was was Mansell's Camel Cannon Labatt's Williams and uh, there's a, a very famous picture which is just wonderful of Ayrton Senna sat on the uh, on the side of the car being driven yeah. in um and yeah that that uh, and and actually just going back and doing some looking at some of those photos that that era of of car in general was so, it was so complimentary to um the uh, the sponsorship they had on the Benetton being in those multi colors Benetton was good. That's yeah. a nice one to go. The Benetton, beautiful, nineteen eighty six. Yeah, Benetton yeah. With splashes so, no, of color. That those those cars. I think one day, if I'm going to have one bolted to a a wall in some fancy gin palace somewhere, it'll be one one of those. I've yeah. got a funny little oh, story, oh, actually, you Chris. You just you just gave me a reminder, Parmalat, which of course I, no one knew what that was. Um, the driving shoe brand we talked about, beginning with T last week. Their head office is in Milan on Corso Venezia, number 30. The most beautiful mansion in Milan, overlooking a park. Next door is the personal house of Mr. Parmalat. Callisto Tanzi. Yeah, and when you, when, you go, when you go and have a lovely meeting at the drive-in shoe company, and there's this beautiful terrace outdoors, a beautiful butler brings you the most wonderful cappuccino you've ever had in your life. The milk is so like cream. And it's all elegant and everything in Italy, as we know, is, is this, it's the country of beauty. But then next door, Mr. Parmalat's mansion has flamingos on the roof. He's got a lake and a little, a little pond and real flamingos on the roof of this place. And when he recently passed away, he handed the whole mansion to the local school for young kids to still be able to come and feed the flamingos on the roof of this central uh, Milan mansion. That's brilliant. So there's a, there's a driving shoe Parmalat flamingo link, which of course. <laughs> I love it. I love the way that Neil Clifford just brings these stories together. That <laughs> is, that's, that's, I that's... mean, for me, a boy from Portsmouth with a 1 0 level with the YTS in the Fiat garage, I'm living the dream. You are. Right? <laughs> I mean, you are, mate. Yeah. I, um, yeah, Parmalat, it was, uh, I used to just be fascinated by 
by by sort of brand names. And there was no Google back then. You couldn't just turn to your dad and go, what's this? Because you'd, you'd go, well, I don't know what you're talking about, mate. Eat your food. Um, and, Shut and, up. Uh, so you had no idea what the things were. So later in life, when you'd find out that they were either rogue or clearly just made up. I always remember there was this energy drink called Hype that was on the side. It was a, it was a fluorescent word on the side of a... Of a of a Williams back in the 90s. That was an energy drink that a load of trustos, I think, got together. How they got their name on a Formula One car, I'll never know. It's brilliant, just, isn't it? I loved it. We, did, yeah. we tried to get Autocar onto a, onto a Formula One car, and they told us to Fox Cross Oscar, but we did get Autocar onto the side of Colin McRae's Focus WRC for the first three rounds of 2000, I think it was. We managed to get that done. Um, was it 2001? No, 2000. Right, uh, this is dragging on. Sorry. Um, first of all, Chris Cooper, we've really missed you. Second of all, on a slightly sad note, we want to just acknowledge uh, the life and career of Craig Breen, who sadly passed away in the last week. Um, Irish rally driver who was um, enjoying a real resurgence to his career in Hyundai this year. Great result in Rally Sweden. And also recently for me personally, uh, some joyous imagery of him in a Sierra uh, on tarmac, an old Sierra. Um, I, d I didn't know Craig, but everyone I spoke to, I've spoken to has nothing, nothing but uh, the kindest words to say about him. It's specifically that he was a real student of his sport. He knew the history. He knew the heritage. He was in contact with the Delacours and the Vatanen because they were his heroes. Um, so our thoughts are with his friends and families at this sad time, but um, his is a legacy that will not be forgotten. Um, and uh, moving on from that, I was going to want to end on a, on a positive note. Uh, let's do our music choices uh, and uh, leave our listeners with something to listen to this week. Uh, what are you going to go for, Edward Lovett? Uh, I am I'm going to do something very unorthodox because, because I've written some down, but I actually don't like any of them. So I'm going to give you something next week. <laughs> but what what I am going to tell you to go and do is listen to it many times over because it's this, I can't get it out of my head now. But it is what I put well, last. Carly Minogue. Pardon? No, 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 not not Carly Minogue. That's next week, darling. Um, but I, I I last week the song was "Text the Sun" by Leon Bridges, and I, I can't stop listening to it. I love that song. Um, so there we go. Go listen to that again. <laughs> I tell you what, what we should do is auction five minutes inside your head. <laughs> Leon, okay. Um, right. Uh, Neil Clifford. I'm in America, um, with work. So I thought I would choose an American song. I, I was brought up with my, my mum owned a cafe in Little Hampton. God knows why she owned that. But we used to drive, we used to drive from Portsmouth in a Mark one escort. PCR 924M, four door actually, quite rare for That's a Mark. A rare one. thing, a four door That's escort. A, yeah, rare car, 1300L, four door. And we used to listen to all these tapes. And it was, it, I know it's called country music, really, but I like to call it folk music because that's a little bit more cooler than country music. So Neil Diamond's, Glenn Campbell, the whole, the, um, the whole world of that. I know every single bloody song, but the Wichita Lineman. Oh wow! Right? That was going to be one of my songs. It's the it's the it's the it's, it's almost the king of songs. If the yes. nine eleven is the king of cars, this is the king of songs. And, and the it, incredible story behind it. There's such a story behind oh, it, but the missing oh, verse and all this other. It's amazing. It's beautiful, <laughs> and it's got the best ever single line lyric, which is, "And I need you more than want you." I mean that that is it. That is pop music. That, that, so, yeah, Glenn Campbell, Wichita Lineman. So sad, but so uplifting. I know, it's yeah. And, and it's full of mystery. Oh, what a great choice. Right, we're all bollocks now, man. We can't follow that. What are you going to go for? Well, I was going to go for something modern classical. Philip Glass, violin concerto, second movement. It's so beautiful. It just begins with a little tiny booming <clears throat> bass riff is the best way I could put it. And this very high violin starts. And the violin's very repetitive. Every, every little piece of music in this, every layer is repetitive. And it just builds and builds and builds. And then it falls off. And it's exactly like your description of driving to Scotland. It's a gentle mm -hmm. incline. You know you're climbing. You get to a peak, which is so passionate. I actually, um, this piece of music inspired me to write a script about the Red Baron. And what this is, is it's the ultimate dogfight and the death of the Red Baron. That's Ooh. what this piece of music is. 
Blimey, Riley. I always feel it's like I've just had a shower of intellectualism when I've been around managed. I just feel <laughs> that, that by process of us, just sort of, yeah, radiation, it, I feel cleverer. Um, and I'm about to completely shit on that now with my. <laughs> <laughs> um, because cause last night um, I watched what is a great film that I've not seen in ages, Kingpin, which is. Oh. is I, you, you forget how good it, it is, but it is, it's got standout performances in all areas, but it's actually got a real killer soundtrack. And I just sat there, because Fowley Brothers know what they're doing, don't they? And I just sat there, just shazamming what was coming on. And there's a tune I hadn't heard in ages, uh, which I think is a, it would be great to listen to in a car, and I'm going to when I get in the car in a minute and drive to London. Uh, and it's by the Electric Light Orchestra, ELO, and it's called Ooh. Showdown. Oh, come really, on. <laughs> it's a great tune. And I'd not heard it in that. so long. Wow. Um, it's not the Wichita Line Man, which is my go-to. I need a blub song, um, right? I've got another. I tell you, well, next next week we'll do songs to make you blub, shall we? Because we'll do that. But the Wichita, <laughs> the Wichita Line Man is is one of those for me. That does I. I it's it's a desert myself. island disc. Uh, Neil, so what did you uh, what did you watch flying over? Did you uh, get Stuart? Are they still playing Stuart on the plane? You know what? The funny thing is, they haven't got it. Stuart on the plane so it was very distressing because I like to watch it every single time on a plane I watched um living which oh beautiful you know what I'm not uh, I'm not a student of film like Manish but you know what it's a wonderful simple gorgeous movie um and you should all go and watch that because it's very simple very uh, just just all about humans and how you should just be decent. Just be fucking decent. So look, when I was teaching myself to write, I uh, this was one of the, the, you know, I used to buy these screenplays. And this is mm. Akira Kurosawa's, I think it's four screenplays. So the big one's Seven Samurai, which everyone's heard of. But the script, I'd never seen the film before, that killed me was a script called Ikiru. And Ikiru yeah. is the original film on which it Living is, yeah. was based. It was rewritten, basically, to be set in Britain in the 50s. But it's about a hapless, pathetic civil servant who's quite happy to be a part of Japanese bureaucracy. And he finds out he's got stomach cancer, which is really endemic to Japan. They're the ones who've come up with the best treatment in the world for it. No one's worked out why. Is it diet? Is it genetics? No one knows. But this guy gets stomach cancer. And he turns his hapless, pathetic, useless life, which is utterly passive, into doing something with his life, just doing something good. That's wonderful. Bill Nye is amazing. And we've just remade that. And it's really, really, I beg people to watch Living. It's such a good film. Yeah, be decent. Don't be an arsehole. Do, and do something with your life. Just do something with your life. Get in your car, drive something. Don't don't start a podcast. We don't want the competition. Right, (laughs) that ends episode 14 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. Thank you to Edward Lovett, to Neil Clifford, to Manish Pandey, and in his absence, to Chris Cooper for being the moral backbone of everything we do. Um, We'll be back as a fivesome next week. Stay well. 